really put it together against UCLA. I think that had to do with the, you know, the practice that we're able to have, the preparation. And then, uh, uh, you know, we uh, obviously, uh, I think we really missed uh, DeMario. I think that was, uh, you know, I, I, it's an excuse, but uh, I think that was tough. I think that was a, a big deal for it. But, you know, it's what, that's the nature of the game be prepared and you got to be able to create depth and work that and uh, we didn't have much rhythm and so we, we're working on that we're working on improving the things that we need to improve because we have to we have to score points now to break down the struggling sun devils a reporter with no bye weeks our very own <laughs> elaine wilson well then let's start things off with the sun devil defense now i know statistically that's actually a pretty solid unit for this team right yeah absolutely they're one of the leading teams in tackles for loss in the nation but the big problem is, is they're not forcing turnovers and it's emphasized in basically every practice so far this season that whoever wins the turnover battle is going to win the game. And uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, they're not really practicing what they're preaching when it comes to that. They're turning over the ball a lot and they're not forcing enough. But I do want to point out that this defense, though they're making key mistakes on key plays, it wouldn't really matter if the offense was doing what they were supposed to be doing. And that offensive unit, Elaine, supposed to be the standout unit for this year's Sun Devil team, supposed to be even better than many high-powered Pac-12 units, but they're just not performing up to but it's also when those receivers are not catching the dimes that Barkovici is throwing, that's obviously causing a huge problem because if one side's inconsistent and the other side's inconsistent, nothing is happening offensively. And we really saw it in Utah. The biggest thing I think is in these losses that Burko has had, uh, USC, Utah, and Texas A&M, his numbers have gone down in each of those in his past completions. He's had an interception in the last two with USC and Utah. And that's obviously a big problem for the Sun Devils. If they can find a solution for this, it, it'll really- Advantage of power play opportunities. WCSN hockey reporter Megan Plain has more. At this point in the season, the Sun Devils have given up seven goals while on the penalty kill, but are only one for 17 when trying to convert on the power play. With 15 freshmen in the lineup and a much quicker pace of play compared to what they saw at the ACHA level last season, Coach Power says they're much more focused on the process than the results. The power play is fine. You know, it, it's. It's all new guys that have never played together, so we knew it was going to take some time, but it's got to start producing for us. We're losing special teams battles in three of the four losses, and, and if that was turned the other way, we, we'd probably have a much different record. ASU's lone power play goal came from freshman Jack Rowe in the team's first NCAA game against Alaska Anchorage on October 9th. Well, we just, you know, we ran our play up top and got the puck to the middle and uh, they shot to me on the side. I took it down a little bit, got a shot through and then followed it to the net and picked up a rebound and put it back, put it uh, past the goal. Coach Power said in his weekly press conference that he wants to change everything about the power play and the Sun Devils have the opportunity to do that tonight and tomorrow night at Oceanside Ice Arena. In Tempe with Cronkite Sports Live, I'm full strength. The star striker and her team, well, they finally righted the ship picking up their first win in more than a month last week against Washington. Now before their matchup tonight against Oregon State, here's ASU Soccer's Madison Camteco. I think that that's something that we've been needing uh, for the past five games. I mean, we beat Pepperdine 5-0 and that's the team we are. You know, that's what we're capable of. And I think that beating Washington, um, we're finally going to get to see um, the team that we actually are. All right, Jason, again, that soccer game is at 7 p.m. tonight. You can catch all the action at Sun Devil Soccer Stadium. But all right, it's time for everyone's favorite segment, social media. This time we bring in Gavin Shaw, world-renowned social media expert. Now, Gavin, right before the show, I think we saw you wearing some New York Knicks athletic shorts. Did you change out of it? You know, last second, Mal, I just managed to get them off. And you guys might have noticed Dude. that I haven't been on the show the last couple of weeks. Well, last year, and this is tough to admit, I deflated some of the tweets so that they would fit on the screen. I, I didn't think it was a big deal, but apparently the FCC was looking to compensate for something I did in the past. Unlike Tom Brady, I've now done my time, and I'm back here to bring you the best in Sun Devil social media. You think you know a guy. We always oh. knew former Herb Sendik prodigy Jahi Carson wasn't necessarily the tallest by basketball standards, but now we have a new way to measure it. No, Jason, not the metric system. I love the this metric system. This is Sun Bear Standard. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that bigger bear, that's what, like six foot even? Smaller uh, bear, like yeah, four Yeah, Jahi is, <laughs> is statistically the shortest basketball player of all time. So You know, I stand at a towering five foot eight, and I know, better than anyone, that's not about actual height, it's about presence. I've got a tall presence, I think Jahi does as well. I don't know, dude, I think Jahi Carson's got to be taller than Muggsy Bogues, but Muggsy Bogues could ball. 
Muggsy Bogues is in the league. Unfortunately, he is not. Yeah, he definitely has the presence, at least to the standard of Australian professional At basketball. least five, six, five, seven. All right, guys, presence. we're going to move on to the next one. Volleyball's own Bianca Ariano. Uh, Whitney Follett has moved to the right side, and Lexi McLean has actually stepped up in that outside hitter role. Now, it's only been four games since she's been out, but how are you starting to see those relationships develop? Well, it's hard to expect some great success against USC and UCLA. I mean, those are some top teams in the country, but there is encouraging signs in the third set of both of those matches. You can expect that offense to be a little bit slower just because they aren't used to each other and they aren't used to those positions. Flett in particular, this is only her second time ever playing the right side in her life. So you can expect those stats and kills per set to go down, especially when you lose somebody of Macy Gardner's caliber. But that being said, moving forward, really liked what I saw from Flett on the, on the right side. She had double-digit kills in both matches last weekend, and Lexi McLean looked impressive as well. Yeah, Zach, you mentioned Lexi McLean making her first two career starts these past two games. A player that wasn't expected to, to play at all this season was expected to redshirt, but of course, desperate times call for desperate measures. Coach Watson burns that redshirt. Based off of those two games, what have you seen out of her? I really liked what I've seen from Lexi McLean. She's a big, powerful girl on that left side pin. She provides a great option for ASU. It's just that she wasn't expecting to play, Absolutely. like you said. But uh, against USC and UCLA, it's hard to expect her to produce what Macy Gardner did in her first two uh, starts. As you see those stats right there, obviously Macy had uh, 18 more kills than Lexi McLean, but McLean was playing top tier comp uh, competition. Macy Gardner, that was in the non-conference season against inferior competition. So um, what you really have to look at is what she did on the court and, and what Lexi McLean did is provide a good option and her development is going to be critical for ASU moving forward. If she can keep that progression going, she provide, provides a great option in ASU's attacking uh, core. Zach, that new Sun Devil formation will be in action tonight at Wells Fargo Arena, 6 o'clock against unranked Utah. Do you think this is the game in which they break that four-game losing streak? I do. They've had two weeks of practice with Flett on the right side, and I think that's going to be they're going to be able to speed up the offense in a way that they didn't, uh, they weren't able to against U USC and UCLA. They're bigger and more talented than Utah, and they still have Cassidy Pickle and uh, Mercedes Benz to provide stability as well. So I would expect a win for ASU this uh, this tonight. Again, that game is at 6 p.m. at Wells Fargo Arena. If you can't make it out, it will be broadcast on the Pac-12 networks. Zach Pocklip with the latest on Sun Devil Volleyball. And Sun Devil Volleyball will be joined by a couple more Sun Devil women's sports. Announced earlier this week that lacrosse and triathlon will be added in the coming seasons. That's all because of Sun Devil Hockey's move up to Division I. They've certainly had an eventful start to their first NCAA season. Trips to Alaska and Connecticut, the team's now back for a homestand in the friendly, albeit homely, confines of Oceanside Ice Arena, as is our Tyler Paley. Tyler, I know there are some great pretzels this year, right? Thanks, guys. I'm here at Oceanside Ice Arena in Tempe, where we are about three hours away from puck drop between ASU and Southern New Hampshire. Southern New Hampshire coming into this one as a Division II NCAA squad, the first of that type that ASU is set to face off against this season. Now, ASU did start at home this year. They played at Gila River Arena, beating Arizona 8-1. to But now they come two towns over to Tempe, where they'll face Southern New Hampshire at Oceanside. Similarities between the two arenas are slim, to be perfectly honest. Oceanside only has a capacity of about 400 fans, with about another 25 media members or so, while nearly 6,000 fans were drawn at Gila River Arena. But due to the proximity of campus, ASU expects the, this place to be full. Now, students will have the opportunity to sit behind the net where ASU will attack twice, giving them the opportunity to potentially see a show put on by their home team. ASU's keys to victories, definitely two of them. One, they have to convert and become better on special teams. They have to draw penalties, they have to convert on power plays, and they have to kill penalties that are assessed against them. So we'll see how that faces off against uh, Southern New Hampshire tonight. Puck drop, 7.30 tonight, 7.30 again tomorrow here at Oceanside Ice Arena. Live from Tempe, Tyler. Thanks, Tyler. The Arizona State football team has spent its bye week focusing on fundamentals. Now, it was a lack of fundamentals that put them in the position in which they're in right now. Three games back in the Pac-12 South standings with only five games, games left to play. WCSN football reporter Brett Decker was at practice earlier this week and has a story on how the team is approaching the final five games. The issues were first exposed against Texas A&M to start the year and then again versus USC in week four. Arizona State was giving away games due to sloppy play. Then, after two straight wins, most believed the issues had been corrected. But after last Saturday's loss to Utah, that's clearly not the case. We missed some opportunities that we should make, that we need to make. You know, do you want to be a championship level team? You got to go do that. This team has talked like a championship contender all season long, but they haven't played like one. Two conference losses already means a Pac-12 South title is extremely unlikely. But even with their goals out of reach, the season goes on. Now, this is a big week uh, in all phases. 
I mean, people talk about, you know, bye week, getting healthy. Now we, we need to get, we need to continue to improve, continue to get better. The same things were said about getting better after ASU's first two losses. So what's different this time? We just have got to do a better job as coaching staff, putting an emphasis and getting the, clear, uh, the players to understand the importance that that could be the difference in the game. It's up 18, 14. How about go force a turnover? Those plays are what's been the difference in ASU's losses so far. So if the changes can be made, the remaining five games are a chance for the Sun Devils to be the team they said they'd be. It's very urgent right now. I mean, we've got five games left on our schedule that, that you know, we're, I mean, we're not looking ahead of anybody, but we have an opportunity to do something special to finish this season off. Their first opportunity comes next Thursday at home against Oregon. From Tempe, I'm Brett Deckard. As ASU might find come bowl season, football doesn't stop when the Sun Devils aren't playing. Now here's Cole Feinbloom with impact, mind the emphasis, a look at the premier matchup in the Pac-12 on ASU's bye week. Cole? Thanks, Jason. This week, one game to watch is the matchup between U of A and Washington State. Mike Leach's Cougs have a prolific offense led by redshirt sophomore Cool Hand Luke Falk. In his last two games, he's thrown for 11 touchdowns and only two interceptions, with a completion percentage of 78%, rivaling my idea of a solid exam performance. In Tucson, a revitalized run game has put the Wildcats back on track, using a committee of Nick Wilson, Gerard Randall, and Jared Baker. Together, along with a few others, the Wildcats have rushed for 659 yards in the past two games combined. The ground and pound facing off against the air attack in a showdown that could have bowl implications for not only these teams, but ASU as well. All three sit within a half game of each other in the overall standings in the middle of the pack, just past the halfway mark on the season. And just a reminder, guys, the last time the Cougs traveled to Tucson in 2013, they took home a victory. 2013, also the last time Washington State made a bowl appearance. Guys, back to you. Thanks, Cole. Great work as always. Now, time for... The segment of all segments, Jason. The way it is, we got three questions each, two anchors and one winner. I'll go ahead and start things off with the kind of uh, hot take on this question. Hashtag hot takes. Mike Bercovici, underrated or overrated? I'm sorry, Burko, but I got to say overrated. Wow. Mike Bercovici, okay. he can't work in the option as well as Taylor Kelly, but they can't switch to a pro-style offense either because the guy can't make reads. I love you, Burko. You're a miracle worker, but you're overhyped at this point. Wow. On to another overrated person, Dick Vitale, Dick EV, baby. He ranked ASU number 38 in his preseason men's basketball top 40. Is he on to something that we're not about this team? Two hot takes in a row from you, Jason. Dick EV is underrated as a commentator, completely overrated at making preseason rankings. ASU should not be considered the 38th best team in the country. They're, they were picked eight to, pick to finish eighth in the Pac-12. That's just ridiculous to me. Jason, ASU hockey was at score 13-1 this past weekend. Do you think they rebound this weekend against Southern New Hampshire? Now, Southern New Hampshire, one of the few D2 NCAA hockey teams out there. I think this is a good reality check from the reality check for the Sun Devils. They're not good enough to bounce with the big boys yet in NCAA Division I hockey, but they're not a bad team either. They'll be just fine this weekend. Mauricio Soccer, five games left in the ASU soccer season. They went out, they got a good shot at the tournament, but can they do it? Uh, Jason, I think it's too many things stacked up against this team. The fact that they've had so many injuries throughout, uh, the fact that they're barely starting to play as a cohesive unit, I think it's too much to ask for them to finish out and win those five games in a row. I don't think they make it, but without a doubt, next year this team is going to be talented. Uh, Jason, we mentioned it earlier in the show, ASU added women's lacrosse as well as women's triathlon as its newest NCAA sports. Now, if you were Ray Anderson, if you were that one man that had all that power, Am which I not sports, Ray Anderson? You, I don't think you are, you know. <laughs> but if you were, which sports would you like to see added? You know, as a fan of the Arsenal team that just took down Bayern Munich, oh I gotta God. say men's soccer, but let me give some love to women's ice hockey as well. Women's sports sweeping the nation, they're a big deal. Mauricio, last question, as always, the most important Absolutely. one of the segment. We've had a cultural shift. The Hotline Bling video finally came out. So what's your favorite Drake dance move? Oh my gosh, Jason. Cultural shift, I think, is an understatement. Drake is out there giving hopes to millions of boys out there that don't know how to dance with his dance moves. Now, if I had to pick one particular one, I really like it when he's sort of breaking it down, breaking it down, then he brings over his leg and kind Ooh, of, you know, I like, like that hits that away, hits That's the bug good. away. It's just real nice, real smooth. Wow. Love it from Drake. Give me that Hotline Bling, Joey. Pick mm -hmm. me. Time to answer? Yes. There was one particular Sun Devil athlete that has always captured my attention. If you were to see him around campus, you probably wouldn't notice him. He looks like your average guy at ASU. But John Rahm isn't average. He's an extraordinary Sun Devil athlete. The golfer comes from a small town in Spain with a population of 1,400 people. 
He's now a senior on the golf team, and he could likely go down as the best Sun Devil golfer not named Phil Mickelson. Last season, he captured the Ben Hogan Award as the nation's top golfer, and this season, his goal is to repeat and bring ASU its first national championship since 1996. Now, we spent so much time worrying about a struggling football team. I think instead we should be taking the time to embrace and recognize one of ASU's top athletes. And Jason, that's the way it is. Excellent work, Mauricio. Thank you. That's some impressive stuff. More impressive stuff. Hopefully we'll see it from the rest of the Sun Devil athletes this weekend, because golf's off, apparently. Here to preview the weekend, we have Eliav Gabay with the weekend forecast. Eliav? Thanks, guys. We're looking at a busy few days in Tempe this weekend. First up, volleyball tries to bounce back against Utah tonight at 6 p.m. Then there's soccer versus Oregon State at 7, followed by hockey against Southern New Hampshire at 7.30. Looking at Saturday, men's and women's swimming faces the UNLV Running Rebels at 11 a.m. Next, there's volleyball versus the Colorado Buffs at 7 p.m. And then more hockey as the Sun Devils will go for their second round against Southern New Hampshire at 7.30. Moving on to Sunday, soccer closes out the weekend versus Oregon at 11 a.m. Wow, a lot going on, but that's all I have for this weekend's forecast. Back to you at the desk. Oh, you have great work. Jason, now it's time for the segment that everyone waits for, everyone loves. No, not social media. We already I did that. I thought we were doing that again. We're doing top plays. Oh. Now we're going to do top plays, the best plays of Sun Devil football so far. They're, it's the bye week. Again, another foreign comp set to help us. But we start with play number three, Tim off the tip. It's Tim White. Look at that. Tip drill. 45 yards for the touchdown against the Colorado Buffs. Tim White, have yourself a day. That's why they're on the tip drill in practice, I think. I've never been to a football practice. Number two, Tim White, the player so nice. We referenced him twice. Slant rhyme, it's a beautiful thing, as is this Tim White kick return. Gets all the way to the outside, and he can't let the kicker beat you. Stumbles, broken, not torn. Makes it to the end zone. Touchdown, Tim. 100 yards to the house. Wowza. All right, man, we've had two Tims, but we've only got one Kalen Bellage. We saw this play a couple weeks ago. It's Kalen Bellage barreling his way into the end zone against UCLA. Hashtag Cole Pole, check Look it out. This. Cody Cole, Cole Pole gets in. None of this Reggie Bush push. It's Cole Pole, Kalen Bellage sealing the win for Arizona State against UCLA. The Sun Devils' biggest win to date, Jason, and an absolutely fantastic way to close off top place for us here. Yeah, we're really back in happier times for this Sun Devil football team. They had gray helmets, clear skies though. You know what they say, clear hearts, can't lose. Jason, that's all the time we got for us here at Cronkite Sports Live. For all of us here, cameramen, producers, audio, everyone, we thank you so much for helping us be a part of the show and we thank you so much, you the audience, for watching. ASU Soccer tonight, be sure to check it out with Mauricio Casillas on the call. Thank you, man. Proud of you.